I know. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Grzmawusa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, and it will be my great pleasure to introduce Kate McNamara to you. Before I do that, I just wanted to remind you that there's going to be another event um, on Thursday. In the Conversations of Europe, we will have the consuls of both Germany and France coming to give a talk entitled The Challenges Facing Europe, a French-German Approach. And now turning back to Kate. Um, Kate is an associate professor at the Department of Government at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and the director of the Mortara Center for International Studies. She's a renowned expert on international political economy and the European Union and has written numerous award-winning articles on European integration, the European Central Bank, the Euro, and the rise and development of financial institutions. She's also the author of The Currency of Ideas, Monetary Politics in the European Union, and is about to publish another book entitled Imagining Europe, Constructing Authority in the European Union. And in short, she possesses unique expertise on the European financial crisis, and so we are delighted here that she is here as part of the Kojayan series on the European economic crisis and its political dimensions. And she will be here to deliver a lecture entitled It's the Politics, Stupid, Explaining the Euro Crisis. Welcome. Okay. First, I should make sure that I'm, as everything is recording and we're good to go. Right, okay, great. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, this is a very interesting week for American politics, so it's uh, great that you decide to take a break from all that, a break from the robo calls and all that other stuff, and uh, come and, and hear a little bit about the European Union. So I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, so I'm going to uh, give this presentation. It hopefully will be about 40, 45 minutes. And then we can do the Q&A. But as I'm going through, if there are uh, any terms that you'd like me to stop and define or things that are not clear, please do speak up. Happy to take sort of informational questions as we go forward. This is a sort of you know, complicated and, and difficult subject. I've been studying it for 15 or so years, and I barely understand it. So those that don't spend uh, lots of time thinking about these things, you know, uh, please feel free to, to ask questions as we go forward. So, as you know, um, we have experienced over the past several years this amazing kind of turn of events from uh, euphoria, right? Everybody thought the European Union was coming unscathed out of the financial crisis, had done so well for so long, had moved forward with integration to the Euro crisis, which really does sort of continually drag on, on and on like this sort of really bad soap opera, right? Um, <clears throat> And it really has even gotten to the point where I think a lot of people have, um, you know, serious people have asked, is the European Union itself dead? Is the European Union itself uh, so heavily impacted by this crisis that we should wor actually worry about its future? So I would argue that we are indeed at a critical juncture, right? This is no joke. This is a very serious crisis. But I think it is useful to think about it in terms of the idea that the European Union really is an innovative governance form, right? It is, a, it is an amazing kind of new political creature on the international stage, but it is held together with duct tape, right? So we have this kind of Rube Goldberg contraption, and that duct tape certainly is fraying. So the problem with the European Union, to sort of highlight the, the big issue here, is can you be sort of pregnant? Can you be half pregnant? The euro, I would argue, is lacking in the needed political foundations, right, that it needs to be successful, and that, more generally speaking, we should always remember that markets need political authority to stabilize them, that governance is a very important part of any market integration project, right? And so thus, this, this title, it's the politics, stupid. All right, so let me walk through sort of this argument and unpack it. First of all, we might want to consider what is the European Union, right? So this is the uh, European Union's um, official slogan, unity and diversity, right? Uh, interesting and intriguing slogan, not exactly clear what it means, right? You have all your different stars and so on. Um, the European Union is neither an international organization, right? It's not something sort of like the World Bank or the WTO or the IMF. But it's not exactly like a nation state. It's something different. It's something in between. It's something that we don't even really have a good vocabulary to explain, right? We don't have a kind of ready-made category that we could fit the EU in, right? 
it has a lot of things that are very state-like. It has this very robust single market, very highly integrated single market that's actually bigger than, than the United States at this point, a single currency. It has a common foreign policy. That's the area that I think is least developed, but they do have a common Euro European foreign policy. It also has a lot of mobility within the European Union. People can move quite freely within the EU. It has various institutions, right? The European Court of Justice, which basically is like a Supreme Court for all of Europe. Its decisions um, are supreme over national decisions. It has a, a sort of executive bureaucracy, the European Commission, European Parliament, European Council, the heads of state and government. So it has a bunch of different institutions that in certain ways mimic what goes on in, say, a federal system, but are not exactly like a state. All right, so maybe we should try to understand why the EU came about in the first place in order to understand sort of what is this strange creature and how should we think about it and what does that imply for the euro. Well, first of all, it's important to remember that political integration in Europe really came about because of political motivations, not economic motivations, right? So you had the European coal and steel community, which started the whole thing off. That was a project that was an effort to bind together France and Germany uh, to put together the uh, parts of the economy that are necessary for war making and make it such that basically it'd be impossible for them to go to war with each other without breaking these different agreements, right? They can keep an eye on each other, they pool their sovereignty. And I think that sort of way of thinking about the EU really has gone through the entire European Union project, all the way up to this most recent big bang in European integration which was the Maastricht Treaty that established economic and monetary union, right? So what happened, what was sort of behind uh, the euro? What, was, what were the political motivations? I think most analysts agree that the euro was not at heart an economic project. It was a political project. And it was a political project that happens on the heels of 1989. So what happens in 1989, the big European event? Anyone? reunification of Germany, the collapse of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? So there's a lot of nervousness in Europe and elsewhere about what this reconstituted Germany is going to be, what Europe will look like without the Soviet Union on the other side and the, and the U.S., you know, sort of keeping, keeping it all together. And so there was a sense that a big movement ahead was needed and that something like the Euro, just as with the coal and steel community, would be a way of binding these states together irrevocably, they thought, right? The single market was to also uh, a reason for the European Union. It's much easier, of course, to have a single market if you have a single currency. But I wouldn't argue at all that it's necessary to have a single currency to make a single market function. We can talk more about that in the Q&A if you like. So, it's the politics, stupid, right? You should really think about the European Union project as an economic means to a political end. OK, great. Say so you accept that. What about this sort of pregnant problem? What does all this mean for the euro and how we should understand what's going on in Europe? So initially, and here is the Berlin Wall, initially, um, European Monetary Union was really seen as, and Maastricht in general, one of the biggest success stories of the 20th century. I mean, it was no, in no way a foregone conclusion that the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the movement of Central and Eastern Europe from the communist fold into being uh, democracies with capitalist system, nobody knew for sure that that was all going to work out. We have a tendency when things do work out to sort of forget that actually things could have gone very badly. And so the Maastricht Treaty, which set up the monetary union as well as political union and uh, also did some work on uh, various types of internal policing and so on, was really seen as a wonderful, peaceful, effective response to the various challenges that were occurring uh, with these geopolitical changes. Problem. What's the problem with all this? Well, it turns out that national borders have a one-to-one -one relationship with national currencies, with one exception, which is the euro. It turns out, historically, we have never had a fully-fledged single currency except in the context of full political integration of a nation-state, right? And so 
we have to kind of think about what are the implications of that? What kind of uh, problems are we likely to see when we do have this new innovative governance form that somehow is going uh, beyond the nation state? Um, and how is that all going to work? Well, first of all, um, one of the problems that the Euro, of course, faced was that even though it began very successfully, it faced this perfect storm, right, in the uh, 2008 global financial crisis, right? So obviously, the financial crisis begins in the uni United States, but it definitely also has very similar characteristics within the European Union as well, right? So you have this credit bubble, you have this rise in asset prices and the financial assets, right? You have the creation of these derivatives, these new types of financial instruments, of financial innovation, as I like to call it, right? Um, which created a situation which made it um, extremely tenuous and unstable. And so <clears throat> the problem is that um, we have seen these financial crises occur again and again and again. Um, if you read the work of people like uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, they have a great book called This Time is Different, where they look at historically at financial crises, right? And what happens in the EU is very similar to what has always happened, right? It starts essentially as a banking crisis in many of these countries, and it becomes a sovereign debt crisis as the banks start to go bust and the, the, the public authorities have to step in and try to save the banks. But the big problem, of course, is that the EU is not really a nation state, right? So you start to see all these terrible uh, bond market crises and pressures happening, right? Um, and so the so-called pigs countries, right, which uh, the people who live in these countries are not crazy about that name, but that's what people often refer to them as, right? Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain are the countries that are under attack by bond markets because they have banking problems that are assumed by their national governments, their debts start to rise, their deficits, their annual deficits are rising, right? Greece is a bit of a special case. We can talk about that. Its problems were not only in the banking sector, but were definitely also very strongly on the government side with uh, all sorts of dodgy accounting and uh, deficit spending and so on. Um, and so the European Union is uh, confronted with this financial crisis. These various countries are um, having all sorts of problems. And I would argue that exacerbating the crisis is the fact of this half-pregnant business, the fact that it is a monetary union without a fiscal or political union, without that bigger, broader context of the nation state. Right? And so this is just sort of a symbolic example. So who's this guy? Tim Geithner, exactly. Does anybody know who that is? Who? Triche was a good guess. Super Mario. Super Mario, another good guess, similar. So it's this guy called uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, who's the Prime Minister of Luxembourg. Yeah, everybody's like, yeah, that's right. See, but you don't recognize him, right? I mean, that's the point, right? So he is actually the head of the Euro Group, which is the sort of group of countries that have the Euro. and. You know, if there was some equivalency to our uh, Treasury Secretary, he might be it on the European side. Folks were right in, 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 in kind of you know, pointing out the different policymakers. The point is, this guy, um, perfectly nice guy, very smart guy, but he really doesn't have the kind of high profile, he doesn't have the political authority, he doesn't have the institutional weight that uh, Tim Geithner has. So what else is going on with the European Union? I, I said, you know, we, we don't have a, a sort of treasury secretary, a unified uh, sort of finance minister. Um, I think, too, what's going on also is on the market side that the EU, this, this political entity that we don't really have a vocabulary for, is really an outlier to the financial markets. They don't know how to think about it. It makes markets very skeptical, skeptical excuse me, about the robustness of the euro about the robustness of the various reforms in the different countries when they don't really have a sense of what this uh, creature is and what the euro really is fundamentally. Greece, interestingly, is under 3% of EU GDP. And actually, that number, I think, is lower now because Greece has had this incredible drop in its GDP. So I'm sure it's like 2.4 now or something like that, right? Um, you know, thought experiment. What if Maryland or a similarly small state in the United States were to default? 
would people start attacking other bond markets within you know, California municipal bonds or, or uh, Michigan bonds or what have you? Um, would there be a fear somehow that our entire republic would be you know, shaken by this crisis and start to fall apart? I think in bond market, uh, financial mi market minds, um, they are not convinced of how robust these political relationships are and how committed these states are to this broader European project. Um, and then, of course, you know, we may not worry so much about Greece's uh, economic impact overall, but when countries that are much larger, such as Italy or Spain, start to get involved and start to be attacked by the financial markets, then, in fact, these fears of contagion, of the spreading of uh, uncertainty and fear about the sustainability of these various uh, positions these states have, of their debt positions and so on, starts to actually become a very serious problem. Interestingly, I would argue that all of this uh, financial market um, crises are not necessarily simply about the fiscal side. They're not necessarily about the fundamental fiscal positions of these countries. Here's some examples of different debt to GDP ratios, right? And you can see that um, Spain is surprisingly, right, one of the lower countries in its debt to GDP ratio, right? Um, so I think it would be a mistake to simply look at those numbers and assume that tells us the whole story. I would argue that you need to look much more at these broader political contexts and you need to understand the way uh, markets and policymakers are thinking about the various decisions that they have to make. Um, so we might understand these uh, financial contagions as to some degree uh, a product of the way traders are thinking about the linkages between these different countries, right? So interestingly, in the Asian financial crisis, for example, there were countries that were attacked in the Asian financial crisis that actually had pretty sound fundamentals but were attacked by the financial markets because they were in Asia, right? There was a sense that there was, there was a relationship between these countries and they were sort of put in the same category. And I think the same thing to some extent happens in Europe as well, right? They're sort of seen as a series of dominoes. One falls and then the next and then the next. That being said, it's not only sort of in people's heads and the way they're thinking about things, there also is the problem of a lack of institutional support for the euro, right? This, this question about the half-pregnant, the political uh, institutions. There is no, uh, let's say, legally stated overt lender of last resort, right, uh, that would provide confidence for the entire eurozone area. The European Central Bank has basically been acting, it's a dirty little secret, has basically been acting as the lender of last resort, even though it's not meant to. You know, legally in the treaties, it's not supposed to play that role, but it basically has been, right? Um, there's no spreading of risk across the EU. If we think about the United States, they have, we have treasury bills, right? We, uh, we can raise money at the federal level, we can redistribute across the different states. If New Jersey's, you know, having a, a horrific time after Hurricane Sandy, we can send money to that area and so on. The EU really doesn't have those types of mechanisms in place, right? Um, no, no troubled asset release uh, exercise of banking bailout, bailouts and no FDIC. So all of these different kind of institutions that would help kind of spread the risk around, create more confidence, simply don't exist at the European level. So, if I'm right, then the solution is obvious, right? They need to build these institutions. They need to complete uh, the construction of the political foundations, the governance foundations, to support uh, the euro, to support these different countries. Um, they need a deeper fiscal, banking, and political union, right? Not just what they really have focused a lot on, austerity rules to deal with the, the deficits, right? So even the economists, right, not kind of known as a, you know, friend of the left and, you know, Keynesian expansionism, right, um, had this as their cover this summer, right? So what would be some of the benefits of this type of deeper union on the financial side? Well, creating something that was an explicit euro bond, right, like a treasury bill for the United States at the European level would clearly go a long way to spreading the risk out over the countries of the EU. Right now, uh, each country has
has their own national bonds that they denominate in euros, but it's a Spanish bond marked in euros, and so on and so forth. With a federal euro bond, they would be able to raise money and redistribute money much more effectively. A banking union is obviously also the next step. Uh, amazingly, right, they had a lot of financial integration in the uh, 90s and certainly in, into the 2000s, but they didn't establish a European-wide regulatory system to um, stabilize uh, that, that financial integration. Um, I mentioned the, Euro the European Central Bank. Clearly, there needs to be a much more explicit discussion about the ECB's ability to act as a lender of last resort. Um, that is a crucial component in creating some sense of confidence and stability in any monetary union. Um, economic uh, union would also allow for these automatic stabilizers and a sort of fiscal federal system which would redistribute um, funds when needed. So in the United States, of course, uh, when one part of the country, like Massachusetts, say, is doing very well, it sends more money to Washington through its tax receipts. When another part of the country is doing badly, it can draw more money in terms of um, unemployment insurance and things like that. And there's an automatic thing that goes on without explicit arguing between Mississippi and Massachusetts and Arizona, right? It's done through these mechanisms, and it doesn't become an overt political contest, right? We have plenty of those, right? I mean, I'm always amazed at how robust our discussions about states' rights and so on are in the United States. But in this area, we do have a more automatic uh, stabilization. We also have fiscal and monetary coordination. It's very difficult to have a European Central Bank that is affecting policy through its, through its interest rates, but is not coordinating those policies on the fiscal side. Politically, I think a deeper union would be very important. I think it would signal to markets uh, that they should have lot, a lot more confidence in the Eurozone. And then, of course, um, if all of this is going to happen, it can only happen with better democratic uh, decision-making representation. Right now, the European Union, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, has sort of gone forward in a very kind of uh, elite-driven, technocratic way. And I think that if these types of institutions are going to be built, um, there will have to be a much uh, serious upgrading of democratic representation in the EU. All right, so that's a pretty big agenda, right? Um, easy for me to say, thank God I'm not a finance minister in Europe. I'm not you know, actually having to negotiate these things. Um, but I think that if you look at history, there's some interesting lessons about the potential paths of the Eurozone crisis. And uh, we can kind of play around with some of these ideas a little bit. Many people argue, and I said at the beginning, the EU has never, uh, we've never seen anything like it before, right? It's an N of one. There's nothing to compare it to. But I actually think if you look at past episodes of political integration, and if you look at uh, past single currencies and look at sort of how we've gotten them in the past, there's some interesting things we can learn. So one lesson is that uh, currencies inevitably come about, except for in the European Union case, um, during uh, very hotly contested, deeply fought war, times of war, right? Currencies have always been part of larger state building projects that occur in the context of violence, of contestation, of, of uh, you know, deeply held political clashes, right? Where developing a single currency becomes something vitally important in order to prosecute a war. <clears throat> um, let me talk for a second about the, uh, the US case. So in the United States, does anybody know when we first got our greenback, the currency that we carry around in our pockets, vaguely? Which century? Or? 1864. All right, fantastic. Uh-oh, I'm scared now. Uh-oh. <laughs> so the point that I draw from that is that um, it took a civil war for us to actually be able to move control over the currency to Washington. If you look at American history, it's uh, over monetary union and fiscal, fiscal questions as well. 
there's always been this deep-seated antagonism about moving some of these uh, sort of levers of economic governance to Washington, right? There was real kind of sense that these should stay at the level of the states. We didn't have a permanent central bank until the early 20th century, right? Um, these were very hotly contested issues that really were only able to be settled uh, in, the con in very extraordinary times, right, in the context of war. Um, and this is, I believe, this is a, a statue of Garibaldi in Rome, right? Um, because if you look at, at Italy, you look at uh, Germany, Switzerland, all these different cases, single currencies always come about in basically in the cauldron of war fighting. So the lessons for the EU is not that they should fight a civil war in order to develop these institutions, um, but rather that it really does take a very serious political crisis to see um, politicians, elites, coalitions form to support these, type of, these types of very drastic moves, right? Um, the political conditions for transfer of monetary and fiscal authority really only come about when there is a real sense of perceived crisis, right? Um, and the EU, of course, is very interesting to me as a political scientist, certainly, because it has come about as a voluntary sort of technocratic project, not in the cauldron of bloody civil war, although keeping in mind, of course, uh, the history of fighting World War II. But I think that the way the EU has developed um, helps explain why we ended up only with the currency centralized in the European Central Bank not these other aspects that have come about uh, in the context of the nation state, right? So I think that, you know, we can understand sort of how we got to this point, right? Um, but on the other hand, I'm not sure that this point is going to be uh, stable for much longer. So the policy implications, right? Decide already. And I guess you guys are going to have, you know, French and German representatives coming to speak to you, and they are exactly the right people to come to speak to you since in the case of, of monetary union, it clearly is France and Germany that are very much uh, in the driver's seat on these issues. Um, but I would say that it's not completely clear which way we're going. If you read the t tree leaves, you can sort of come up with some different ideas about whether we're moving forward or going to be rolling back. Right? This is pretty much the, the response of the Europeans. I lost count of how many summits they've had about the euro crisis. I think it's, some, you know, it's like 22 or something by now. Um, that being said, I think there is a decent argument that there is incremental progress being made going forward, right? That the European Central Bank, as I said, has really uh, acted much more aggressively than I certainly would have ever thought they would have. Being a student of the ECB, somebody who's, who's studied it since its origins, um, I'm actually very surprised at how they have bought up this debt, um, how they have spent literally um, you know, billions and billions and billions of euros to try to keep these various member states afloat, to try to make the markets calm down, to try to have a sense of stability. And this has not happened without controversy. I mean, you know, these, these things are very controversial within Europe, this question of moving much more authority um, to these new institutions. Um, they have set up uh, a bunch of new institutions. If you're students of the EU, you know, more acronyms to learn, uh, right? Um, and they're basically various institutions which are efforts at providing funding in times of emergency, right? So that markets will be more convinced that uh, their money, their investments will be, uh, will be secure. And then finally, most recently, they've also been working on this notion of a banking union. You may have read in the last month or so, um, the last summit they had, um, they agreed that they would go forward, but not sort of immediately. And um, Angela Merkel is talking very much about making this a slow process towards banking union and so on. But certainly, there have been institutional changes and innovations. But it's very clear that this may not be enough, right? The social cost of austerity, which has been the sort of you know, domestic level response to all this, is to try to cut spending as dramatically as possible in an effort to make markets feel more uh, uh, um, secure about the future of these various countries. Um, and of course, we also continue to worry about the democratic deficit. This is the European Parliament building. Um, again, we can talk about this more in the Q&A. Um, 
particularly the moves of the European Central Bank, which is the world's most independent central bank. It has the least amount of political oversight of any central bank in the world. And it has really been the actor that has been the most aggressive and most, in certain ways, more, most effective. And so we might, we might want to ask whether uh, the polity of Europe is comfortable seeing those types of decisions being made in a, in a context that does not have at least overt democratic representation. So I do think this is a transformational moment, a critical juncture, as I said. Um, I think that democratic politics are messy and ugly and necessary. So we shouldn't be surprised when we look at these historical examples um, that political integration, economic integration, single currencies, and so on inevitably invoke a tremendous amount of political disquiet. They inevitably evoke um, important debates about how to organize um, society, how to organize governance. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we're seeing this in Europe today. And if we look back even at our own American history, we will see many of the same types of conflicts going on uh, through, the, through the years. Um, and so the, the you know, very interesting question, I'm not sure I have the answer to, but we can, we can try to get into it a little bit more, is will the EU succeed as an innovative governance forum, right? The stakes are that high. It has tried very, very hard to situate itself somehow different from the nation state, different from an international organization, you know, if you look at the coins, even symbolically, right, they have European symbols on one side, and that's actually the German eagle on the other side, and then national symbols on the flip side of the coin. They've constantly tried to figure out how to navigate between the, the existing loyalties of the various nation states and yet come up with a governance structure that works. So the question is, will it succeed or will it fail and disappear? The Hanseatic League at the time uh, was considered several centuries ago a great innovative governance form that might provide a solution to economic integration and political gov governance. And of course, it, it fell by the wayside. So we, we will have to wait and see what happens with the European Union. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Andy Markovitz, Professor Markovitz. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, um, one is, and uh, you, you kind of touched on it at the end, but the word uh, solidarity yeah. is missing in your talk. Yeah. And it seems to me that as long as West Germans who were grumbling big time about the transfer of billions and billions, first of Deutschmarks and then of Euros, to the east, but they actually did it yeah. with solidarity taxes and so on and so forth. But they're just not ready to do this for the Greeks. By the way, they're not only doing it for the Greeks, but the German banks, but that's a different story. Uh, I think that this is a serious issue and has to be addressed. Namely, I totally agree with your, your, your premise. It's politics, stupid, but it's more, you know, it's politics in the sort of small p dimension mm -hmm. and the solidarity part is absolutely crucial and the willingness yes of course they have the two authorities on the same coin and every parliament building has the the two flags but obviously in terms of sovereignty these states have not yet quite yeah. done the big step of really receding on this and then the second point is that uh, you know f folks like you and me of course always want democracy and and the democratic deficit that you raised very wisely and in fact I would say the entire project is an elite project yep. and I always give it as an example in my class that actually elites sometimes would do good things because I think the EU is by the way a wonderful thing um, so uh, what is to say that the democratic deficit will be something strengthening the EU and not killing it um, I yeah. would be very worried about uh, kind of putting this democratic deficit to a test mm. in virtually any European country. And I would be not certain, certainly in the next three, four, five, six years, 
that a democratic process would actually yield precisely something that you and I would like. Huh. So I hear two contradictory things in those two questions a little bit. Okay. Um, I, I mean, the first question rightly points out that, you know, when I was talking about it's the politics stupid, I was really talking about political institutions, really, right? We, I went through my whole song and dance about the institutional sort of things that were lacking and so on. But you're right, institutions only work in so much as they have societal coalitions that support them and, and feed into them and so on. And so without that sort of societal support, that solidarity, how can you possibly imagine you know, undertaking all these various institutional developments that I'm talking about? And so, um, you know, if you look historically, uh, the folks that established currency unions as part of state building projects weren't hugely um, preoccupied with solidarity, right? So we have Bismarck, you know, we have um, the French state kind of, you know, shoving all this stuff through uh, in the 19th century. Even in the American case, right, it's, uh, you know, during the war, Lincoln has long wanted to have a single currency, but the so southern states are objecting to it. Well, once they secede and leave the Congress, they're able, the northern Republicans are able to kind of shove it through, right? So, you know, the message from history is that relying on solidarity does not allow you to necessarily kind of move this stuff forward, but this is the 21st century, right? And the EU is built on very different ideals. It's built on ideals of, of law and democracy and so on. So I think they really are in, in clearly in a bind, right? Which kind of leads to your second question, which is, you know, technocracy worked really well through, you know, a very long history, 50 years of the European Union. You know, it seems to me I was originally an international relations person, and when I look at Europe today, you know, it looks pretty good compared to what it looked like for, you know, a really long time, right? Um, so, you know, I think that there is this profound tension. How to solve it? Um, I think that the European leaders, uh, it has been striking to me, uh, Merkel, but others as well, that they have not framed this crisis in a way that would make deeper integration attractive to their publics. I think that's been very interesting to watch. I think there's been a real sea change in terms of how Germans think about themselves in Europe in this crisis. Um, but I mean, I'd be curious to hear other, other folks' uh, thoughts on that. I think there is a lot more room for constructing a narrative about why it's important to make sure that the Eurozone does not fall apart. Um, I think, too, it's very important to remember that ultimately it is not really about the sovereign debt stuff. It's really about the banking crisis. That's really where it started. That's really where the financial problems are. Um, but I think most people don't realize that, right? They think it's about, you know, profligate uh, Portuguese and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there's a lot more room for um, visionary uh, political elites to sell this to their publics um, more effectively. That's probably not a great answer, but that's, that's the best I can do right now. Other questions? Yeah. So uh, could I ask you to take that a, a step further? Sure. Uh, looking at it from an economist, uh -huh. uh, Jim Adams, Department of great. Economics, looking at it. Do I have to turn this on? Yeah, I think they're recording it also, yeah. <laughs> No, I think it's working. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, so most economists, I think, would take the position, whether they're for or against the euro, mm -hmm. uh, would take the position that if you're going to have monetary union, you need fiscal union. Right. We could discuss that, but right. most of them would argue. So that where we are is just not a stable resting right. spot. So if you do want the monetary union, you need right. the fiscal union. So that then becomes a political issue rather than an economic issue yeah. about how you mobilize for that. And you'd need one story if you're going to mobilize right. as an elite, or you'd right. need another story if you're going to mobilize uh, democratically. Right. My question is, when, when you think about Merkel's position announced relatively recently, that mm -hmm. is within the past couple of months, mm -hmm. uh, yes to fiscal union, yeah. uh, but only if there is more political union, yeah. um, I wonder if you could elaborate on the domestic politics that would be needed in some of the key players to achieve that. Right. Okay. Great. Um, 
So I will be honest with you. I think that um, monetary union is a very difficult issue to make comprehensible to people at the sort of level of the person in the street, right? And so I think that the task is very, very difficult, and it's extremely hard to um, help people figure out what their sort of uh, particular economic interests are in, say, monetary union, fiscal union, so on and so forth, right? So I think it's a very murky area, and that's actually why I do think there is a big responsibility on the part of European leaders to try to frame these issues in ways, you know, if they do believe that the European Union is worth fighting for and, and the Euro is worth fighting for, and, you know, again, we can debate that. Um, I think they need to focus on the fact that um, these countries, before they entered into the monetary union, before they entered into the exchange rate system that, that preceded it, had terrible problems with inflation, with depreciating currencies, right? Had terrible problems attracting international investment. Um, so I think there are, you know, and you probably know as well as I do, right? There are a kind of, there's a laundry list of things that, that you can talk about. Um, I think more difficult are these questions of winners and losers and who's paying and who's, who's not paying, right? And that's why I was talking about, you know, it's very nice if some of this stuff can ca be less visible, right? And that's why I think, to some degree, institutional solutions, we're, 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 I bet we're going to see kind of increasing incremental institutional changes that will effectively create many of these things I'm talking about but do them in less overt, less visible ways, simply because of, of the problems of figuring out how to create you know, these domestic coalitions that would support it. You're nodding, so I'm, does this sound reasonable to you? Yeah, you Absolutely. agree? Yeah, okay, great. More questions? Yes, Anna. You mentioned the ECB and how it's assumed this willy-nilly role. You mentioned the ECB and uh -huh. how it's assumed this willy-nilly role as a lender of last resort. Yeah. So has there been any sort of serious moves made towards actually making it, you know, a, a real lender of last resort to, have, to give it that muscle. Let's see. So definitely. I mean, it's very interesting. There is a free-for-all going on in Europe right now. I mean, you know, so Vox EU, right? There are these websites with a lot of really smart, uh, often European economists, but also a lot of other economists from around the world, have been kind of working through all sorts of different ideas about, um, you know, the Eurobond stuff lender of last resort stuff, and FDIC for Europe, and also, I, I think everything is in play. What's sort of harder to figure out is, um, you know, who's going to support what, and I think Merkel has clearly been moving a little bit towards, you know, there were certain things that were so taboo, nobody could, you know, it would never even come out of her mouth, right? I think fiscal union at one point would just, she would have never said that, right? And so now I think some of those taboos have been broken which is very interesting, right? Once the taboos start to get broken, then you, know, you can kind of see more, more solutions coming forward. Um, so yeah, I think it's all, all on the table, um, but you know, I'm not sure that the publics are quite yet behind some of the solutions. Any comments, questions? Yeah. Uh, my name is Justin Maiman. I'm with the um, Knight Wallace. I'm the actual Knight Wallace uh, Fellow for Business Reporting oh, great. here at the University. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, politically, how many do you need, how many countries do you need in a European Union? Mm -hmm. If you assume that, that Greece, uh, for mm -hmm. both its own interests and for Germany's interests um, and others, has to leave eventually, mm -hmm. uh, or it's forced to leave, um, and then maybe Portugal left, and then maybe Italy has, you know, its banking crisis worsens, how many at the end of the day does it still make sense um, for it to be a monetary union mm -hmm. without as many states as a part of it? Okay, great. So you actually said how many does it need to for the EU, but I think yeah. you mean for the euro? Yeah. yeah, which is interesting, right? Because we definitely conflate those two things, right? Because what are the implications for, you know, the European Union has always, it's, they had this bicycle theory thing, where, right, where you always had to be going forward, otherwise you'd fall off, right? And so the euro crisis really has been this moment where, you know, people are like, well, what would it mean to have something really fall apart and fail and, and you know, states exit? And they also come up with all these, you know, fun terms, like Grexit, you know, Greek exit is Grexit. And anyhow. <laughs> um, 
so let's see. so clearly they could have you know a core of the you know most robust fiscally orthodox states, you know germany, netherlands, et cetera france, and so on. and it would still be a meaningful monetary union, clearly, to me. i mean these are big countries, and if they are still decide to keep a single currency you know that uh, is important and particularly if it's you know the key kind of political players who are bound together well then that's what you know supposedly this was all about was binding together France and Germany as the key players and so on and so forth um, that being said you know it's very clear that many people uh, such as Merkel and so on and I'm sure you know this very well um, have such an antipathy to the notion of failure and to the notion even of Greece, right, which everyone knew when I was in graduate school. Are there Greeks here? I, I shouldn't. This is going to be up on the web. It's going to be really bad. Anyhow, when I was in graduate school, it was, it was always kind of mentioned that Greece was the, kind, was the sort of outlier country in terms of its political institutions, its economic um, situation, and so on. And I think, you know, clearly it should never have entered the euro. That was, you know, crazy, right? Um, so I think it's it's this sort of multi-speed Europe with a smaller core Eurozone, I think is, you know, logically quite possible. And um, even though I do think there is tremendous resistance to seeing that happen, and I really think it's really only Greece. I think the other countries are absolutely going to stay within the Eurozone. Um, I think they're, I'm, yeah, I would, I would be very, very surprised if other countries such as Spain and so on left. So yeah. I'm sorry. So then yeah. do you see it expanding as well? Do you no. see? No, no, <laughs> no. I don't see it expanding. I mean, I think, you know, such an interesting question. You know, we used to argue about widening versus deepening when it came to the European Union. Uh, and it's very clear that widening is over, over for now. The EU itself, I think, will not expand any further for some, you know, good period of time. Um, and uh, I also think that the cost of the Eurozone crisis, um, you know, it's, it's not immediately evident that anyone's going to want to join at this point. <laughs> yeah? Can you explain briefly um, the uh, some of the uh, political and economic ties of the European countries that are not in the mm -hmm. EU? For example, Great Britain, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Hungary, uh, Romania, um, Poland. Okay. I, I think that's your job, actually. <laughs> I am really not great on uh, Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. But um, what are the relationships? So I mentioned very briefly that a single market does not require a euro, and maybe that will sort of help get at this a little bit. Um, so, you know, Canada is the United States' biggest trading partner, and we have different currencies, and yet we still continue to integrate. And, you know, if you look at the econometric um, studies, uh, exchange rate variation does not seem to significantly dampen trade back and forth, right? It turns out that uh, particularly large companies have become extremely good at hedging exchange rate risk, right? So I think the same is true in terms of the single market, right? That I think um, the countries outside the Eurozone have uh, uh, done well within the single market. Um, I think Britain is what makes Britain, the UK, the most nervous is, of course, the notion of a banking union, which is going to decide a bunch of stuff and have a bunch of regulations. And, you know, they are the banking, obviously, banking capital of Europe. That they won't be part of that political process is, uh, you know, very uh, nervous-making for them, right? Um, so I think that the single market continue, continue to be, you know, a very robust uh, uh, set of relationships, regardless of what happens uh, in terms of the eurozone crisis. So, are all European countries part of the single market? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Twenty-seven. Yeah. And that really is, you know, an incredibly well-developed part of the EU. I mentioned the uh, European Court of Justice. It has basically um, purview. It has supremacy over and can rule on anything involving market integration, which it turns out is a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff they didn't even think would be part of market integration, like uh, women's labor rights, things like that, equal pay rights, stuff like that. There's been a real kind of encroaching on all parts of European law from the level of the European Union. Yep, in the back. Um, first of all, thanks for a wonderful reminder of how complex this whole thing really is. <laughs> oh um, I, I'd like to ask you to 
continue sort of unbundling mm -hmm. a bit the uh, Eurozone from the European Union. Okay. Um, it seems to me you've largely, until the last couple of minutes, sort of viewed them as co-terminal. Yeah. And I think there's another way of looking at this, which could be that, in fact, even as the Euro has kind of fallen into crisis, that other institutions, uh, segments of the European Union, have actually been strengthening, extending their jurisdiction, mm. and integrating more effectively uh, in non-economic spheres. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And, um, Are you thinking of anything in particular? Well, I, I, just the court, for example, uh -huh. that you yeah. mentioned, and yeah. uh, the way in which the European Union has extended its, let's say, standards, legal, yeah. uh, agricultural, right. economic, all these things through the um, process of expanding or the SAAs in, in candidate countries. Mm -hmm. um, and could you maybe just talk about the possibility, maybe, mm -hmm. that the EU could very well survive mm -hmm. whatever crisis yeah. the euro goes through uh, without actually uh, even slowing its momentum in yeah. uh, other areas of integration? Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great question. So I, t I do tend to think of it as sort of like the EU is this iceberg. And the euro crisis is the part above the water that everybody sees, and it's like, oh no, look, you know, there's the iceberg, whatever. But actually, there's this huge, kind of, uh, you know, part that's under the water that we don't really see, and a lot of it is this sort of day-to-day -day stuff. I mentioned the court, which is incredibly important, actually, um, in sort of uh, shifting laws on the part of the nation states uh, away from the national setting towards the European level. And a friend of mine, Dan Kellerman, has done some great work tracing out actually how that's also shifted the entire entire legal regime in Europe. You know, unfortunately, they have become uh, much more, I can't say this word, but it means litigation, litig that word, you know, when they, <laughs> litigious, thank you. When they litigate against each other all the time, they've like really shifted, not because of some American influence or whatever, but because actually of this new European level of law. Um, I think actually, you know, people make fun of the EU and it's, lame foreign policy and everything, but I actually think they've been doing a lot. I think it's actually surprising. You know, they, they started up a new uh, sort of European diplomatic service a couple of years ago called the External Action Service, um, which is basically um, creating a sort of network of, of European Union uh, diplomats all around the world. You know, when I sit in Washington and I talk to various folks in the embassies who run foreign policy for the different member states, they spend all their time in meetings with other EU diplomats, right? I mean, they are so tightly integrated into, you know, these institutions, these policy networks and so on, that I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for this sort of banal, incremental kind of habits and practices over time. And it's very clear that after 50 years of this stuff, you know, with these various kind of big bang treaties along the way, there's a lot that's quite uh, robust. Nothing's ever permanent. Everything can fall apart, clearly. But I think that we uh, should remember that there are all these kind of networks of relationships that are continuing. Um, of course, the citizenship and mobility stuff is amazing. I don't know, is there anybody here who had an Erasmus grant? No, no European. So they have this very big program so that college students can go and spend time uh, within the European Union and pay their local fees. So if you're you know, German, you can go to St. Andrews and pay what you would have paid in Germany, right? And people take advantage of this. So you have this, you know, this whole kind of several generations of young folks in Europe that, you know, I think mentally they are sort of re, you know, drawing new boundaries for what Europe means to them. Um, there's a movie, L'Auberge Espagnole, which captures this, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, all of that stuff is actually quite persistent and will actually survive the Euro crisis, for sure. Anyone else? Uh, yep, and then back to Anna. Um, you mentioned in one of your answers to questions uh, that the fear of currency fluctuations mm -hmm. was not a real impediment to investment. I thought that was one of the few advantages to the Euro, other mm -hmm. than the fact that nobody yeah. has, knows yeah. how to get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly convenient not having to exchange currency and going from one country to right. the other. But are there really any fundamental advantages to a single currency? So there definitely are advantages. And that was, that was how it was sold, interestingly. There was this um, 
wonderful document called one market, one money, which was the big kind of report that the european commission did. and they stressed that it would be like a you know two percent of european gdp increase because of the euro and this and that and you know for sure, of course, logically, you know, stable currency is going to be uh, better for investment and expectations and all that kind of stuff. But um, I have yet to be convinced that it is a net economic benefit. I mean, I guess it also depends, you know, where you sit and and you know, are you a, uh, a worker or an investor or you know, at the top of a multinational corporation? Are you in Italy? Are you in Germany. The Germans have actually done very, very well with the euro, right? Because German products normally tend to be more highly priced in other markets because the German mark was a very strong currency, right? And so this is part of the narrative of Merkel that she really could make a stronger statement about how the euro has really benefited German exporters, right? And all the workers who, who, who make the things that get exported. Um, it has uh, allowed um, uh, them to be more competitive you know, than they would have otherwise been within within Europe. So I think it's a real mixed bag. It's not a very satisfying answer, but I think that's yeah. that's the right one. Yeah. Uh, Anna, or should I? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, how has the ECB raised the funds to buy national bonds, mm -hmm. uh, relief programs, and so forth? Is the ECB allowed to print euros? Or do they have to get loans from member states to have those funds mm -hmm. available? Mm -hmm. And I guess the other question is, um, as a transitional mechanism to fiscal union, uh, is it possible that the individual states could still issue national bonds and, in addition, yeah. introduce euro right. bonds? Right. Good. Exactly. So, um, yes, so the member states uh, give money into the European Central Bank, and that forms the sort of capital initially, right, that the bank then uses. They're not supposed to print money. That's the, what they're not supposed to do. But some of the things that they've been doing are sort of somewhat equivalent in the sense of uh, guaranteeing uh, the, the debts of the member states and so on and so forth. And then you're exactly right. The national, they presumably they'd continue to use national bonds as well as this euro bond, just as you know the member states of the United States continue to have their own their own bonds, right, at the at the state level. Exactly. Yeah. Anna. So I'm going to monopolize. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to talk about I'll ask you about this political failure, right? So why is it that the whole mm -hmm. crisis has been framed in terms yeah. of sovereign debt and those you know profligate Portuguese yeah. and those Greeks that can't you know they're so corrupt instead of talking about the banking problems and the fact <sighs> that you know Germany actually has hugely benefited right. from being able to extend these loans? All right. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, maybe our re financial reporter can, can answer that question because I mean I think. You know, one could ask the same question about the American context to some degree, right? That there are, you know, problems with American banks that I don't think are getting fixed, right? And, um, you know, I think that things are made, as I said, made worse in the European setting because we did have tremendous amount of financial integration in the 2000s without an effort to build a system-wide banking regulatory system. Right, and that was clearly a big mistake. Right? Um, why didn't it happen? There's starting to be some work on this. Um, I think there's been some work looking at the fact that, of course, in the different European countries, the banking systems are set up quite differently. Right? So there are, you know, lots of different ways of thinking about um, setting up your banking system, and um, the role of the the federal or central state. You know, you have very um, decentralized systems such as Germany, you have much more centralized systems such as in France, and I think that initial kind of, you know, the d difference in the starting point has actually um, made it more difficult for them to think about, you know, dealing with the banking side. But it's very clear that that's really where the action is now, I think, and so there really is sort of a sense that, that things need to happen. Um, again, I think that you know, in all this stuff, as in the, the American financial crisis, that 
there's such a disjuncture between what we could possibly try to understand as voters and as citizens and what may be sort of going on in the complexity of these issues that i think it does create its own kind of democratic deficit to some extent um, and so i think that um, that that is always just a huge problem right in the european setting and, and elsewhere not very not very optimistic but you're all here so you're learning about it so that's good okay <laughs> Other questions? I think there is. Yep. I just had one follow on. Sure. So, in the European Union, there is complete mobility of people. So, why wouldn't citizens of Spain and Greece yeah. just flock to Norway yeah. and get, uh, receive <laughs> welfare checks? And why is it that Romanians are being ex expelled from France? How is that possible? Yeah. So, of course, Norway is not a member of the EU, but they could go to Sweden or some other really nice place. Um, so that's a great question. And so many of the folks that studied monetary unions pointed out they work much better in a place where there's a lot of uh, mobility for work. That in fact, you know, if 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 you can't depreciate your exchange rate, you know, if you're the Pacific Northwest uh, and you have a, a boom and bust cycle around the timber and the airline industries and whatever, um, and you have no jobs, you know, and you can't depreciate your currency and make your exports cheaper and stuff, what do you do? Well, you know, the workers maybe just move to Texas, right, where the oil industry is booming or something like that. And the EU obviously has, it does have much lower levels of mobility in terms of workers than the United States, right? Um, there are obviously multiple languages. Um, you know, I think there's much less a tradition of, of moving house, you know, at the drop of a hat. Um, I think you know service workers have always done that. Um, you know, I think there's a certain uh, group of people in a certain uh, class of society in, in Europe that does that is quite nimble and does move around. It tends to be at the bottom or at the very top, the so-called Euro stars. There's work on on those guys who just kind of, you know, go to um, you know Barclays in London and then move to Rothschild in in Paris and whatever. But everybody else is sort of in the middle and really reluctant reluctant to move. Um, the EU has done a ton to try to promote mobility. Um, and so one of the interesting new areas that's been uh, kind of, ch where there's been change is actually around um, making your uh, uh, social benefits portable, health benefits and social benefits, and sort of creating a situation where you could um, actually take advantage of uh, social benefits and health benefits and so on wherever you are. Uh, within Europe, and I think that's you know one of the, you know I think they're thinking very very hard about this question and how to try to create the conditions where people would move more readily. Well, you said Norway's mm -hmm. not part of the European Union. My, my family's Norwegian, and mm -hmm. I have an uncle who has a condominium in Bergen, and is in the winter he lives in the in uh, Valencia in Spain, ah, and there you go. receives all his health. Gets yeah. All his health care stuff in Spain. Right. And as I understand it, the Norwegian government pays Spain. Because they have so many citizens who uh -huh. right. live in Spain. Right. So right. Now that's definitely a phenomenon. As as is actually um, uh, healthcare shopping, where people will now start to look at what are the kind of um, outcomes for, say, a certain type of heart surgery in Perugia, Italy, versus you know wherever they live in in Portugal or what have you. So there actually is starting to be more mobility in that sense, which is quite interesting, actually. Because that does kind of touch into people's lives and down into the kind of social, you know, groups and starts to make the EU much more real to people and the costs of not having that start to become almost something where you can't imagine not being able to take advantage of that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Sure. I'm sorry, I was just hoping <laughs> if you could, we haven't really talked about austerity. Mm, good, austerity yeah. Austerity seems to be um, yep. the latest yeah. Um, across all of Europe, right? Um, based on basically the you know the fallout from 2008, right? Um, can you talk a little bit yep. about how it's? Yeah. So, so this is very interesting. So austerity has been very much the sort of um, go-to solution to all of these financial problems, right? It's sort of very appealing. You know, if there's too much debt, if there are high deficits, why not just cut spending? you know, live within your means, all that kind of stuff, right? And, and there's also, um, I think in German economic circles, there's a great appreciation for living within your means and so on. You know, there's a long history of that. And 
in my earlier work, I actually did a lot of, of work on the notion that um, the euro itself was, was viewed as um, something to help kind of shore up, you know, being less inflationary and being more kind of orthodox and, and austere and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's very clear that this crisis will, you, it's very hard to get out of a crisis like this one by cutting spending because it can be this real spiral down, right, where um, people um, don't have money in their pockets and therefore you can't kind of restart your economy and so on. And actually, I think there has been a little bit of a shift away from austerity as the answer. I don't know if you guys are picking up on this as well, but, you know, Merkel has actually in the last couple of months, you know, talked more about growth. Um, you know, when the IMF starts telling Europe that it needs to grow, grow more, you know something's up, right? I mean, I think there has been somewhat of a shift um, away from the notion that austerity is going to cure everything. On the other hand, I'm not sure whether they figured out what would replace austerity, right, and how to actually achieve growth. Um, because again, it gets us back into this murky area of fiscal union and, you know, trying to um, um, sort of mutualize debts and trying to kind of think about solving it collectively as opposed to just looking at, to each state to cut uh, spending. Yeah. But that is exactly where I think a lot of the interesting conversation is going to be going on in the next few months, six months, year, two years. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <clears> Thank <throat> you.